the account of this domino effect, it is here for us as a warning for whenever we are tempted to take matters into our own hands and drive them forward in our own way. And I suspect each one of us, we know something of that temptation and have seen something of the disastrous results. Welcome to Encounter the Truth with Jonathan Griffiths. And uh, Jonathan, I think one of the things that looking back at even these early stories of the Old Testament remind us is that, you know, we don't sin in a vacuum. And when sin uh, enters the picture and when we sin, it doesn't just impact us, but there can be a domino effect. It, It really impacts those around us as well. Well, I think Abram and Sarai learned that lesson the hard way in the incident that we're going to be looking at today in Genesis chapter 16. Sin is messy, and it makes a mess of relationships, and it impacts other people. I guess we probably know that experientially. We've learned something of that in the real world, but the Bible makes it so clear for us. And it's a sobering lesson in the passage today, but it's hope-filled because it's not the end of the story. I often think with some of these disasters in the life of Abram that, you know, the Bible could have been a very, very short book because yeah. God could have given up in Genesis chapter 12 or 13 or, or, or 16 as we are here today. But we look at the Bible and we realize it's really quite a long book and this isn't the end of the story. And our mistakes, our sin, our rebellion, if there's repentance that follows, it doesn't need to be the end of the story, and that's that's a great encouragement. Maybe it's the encouragement that some need to hear today who are listening. Well, I hope that you will keep listening. If that's encouragement that you need today, I hope you will not only listen, but that you will grab a Bible and join us in the book of Genesis. We are in chapter 16 as we begin the message, The Cost of Self-Reliance. Here is Jonathan. I wonder if it ever seems to you that the plans... And the purposes of God are rather slow in coming to fruition. His plans and purposes for the gospel, for the church, for the world, his plans and purposes even for you personally. Gospel progress, it often seems unremarkable, doesn't it? Response, it it often seems meager. Reaching the unreached to the very ends of the earth, it's taking a little bit of time isn't it? And we might well ask, will the job ever be completed? Will the task ever be done? In the personal sphere, perhaps you sense that the Lord has set before you a certain task, a certain responsibility, but it's hard to gain traction with it. He's put it on your heart to serve in a particular way, but the opportunity, it just hasn't presented itself. The door hasn't been opened. You you feel that it is his will for you maybe to get married, but it hasn't happened yet. You believe that he wants you to pray for a loved one, a relative, to come to saving faith, but you've prayed for years and there's been no change of heart. When you and I are called upon to wait for the outworking of the plans and purposes of God, there is a great temptation that often arises. And it is the temptation to take matters into our own hands, to seek to achieve God's purposes in our own way, in our own time, and on our own terms. Genesis chapter 16 is the story of two servants of God, two people of faith who succumb to that very temptation. It's a messy incident. It's a blot on Abram and Sarai's record. It comes to us as a cautionary tale, a warning against taking matters into our own hands when we are tempted to do so. And it's here to highlight for us the sheer grace of God whose plans and purposes will not be derailed and will not be destroyed by the folly of his servants. This story of two believers who attempt to pursue God's purposes in a very human way, it highlights for us, first of all, the domino effect of sin. The story of the life of Abram and Sarai has been a bit of a roller coaster so far as we've traveled through it together in these early chapters of Genesis. There have been some real highs, 
where they have trusted God and walked with him in costly obedience, responding in faith to the word of promise. There have also been some lows, haven't there? Times of fear and of outright failure. In the grand sweep of their story, Genesis 16 does mark a particular low point. It actually reads like some kind of a Greek tragedy, I think. It unfolds as a drama that you, you sort of wince at at every turn. Maybe you've watched a film or read a novel like this. You can just see the key characters walking into disaster and you want, to, you want to cry out to them. You want to shout at the television screen. Look, stop this. Don't do this anymore. Pull back from this dreadful plan. Every new move, each fresh compromise, it seems to dig them into a deeper and deeper hole. And you begin to wonder, is there any way out of this thing? The chapter opens on an ominous note. Now Sarai, Abram's wife, had borne him no children. Given what we know of the promise of God to make of this family a great nation who would bring blessing to the world, this issue is a big issue. This problem is a big problem. Only a few verses ago, God had taken Abram outside to look at the night sky. You remember this moment. To look at the stars of the sky. And he had declared to Abram that his offspring would be as many as the stars above. He had then confirmed his covenant to Abram in that rather dramatic ceremony at the end of the last chapter. The promises of God were ringing in the ears of Abram at the end of Genesis chapter 15, but the hard reality hadn't changed. Abram and Sarai were old and getting older, and Sarai was still barren. They had been living in the land of Canaan for a decade now, Verse 3, by this time Abram is in his mid-80s, verse 16, and for Sarai, all of this must have been incredibly tough emotionally and spiritually. The hopes and the expectations of the family, the very promises of God for the future, not only of their family, but of the world, it all rested upon her having a baby. And it simply wasn't ha happening. It haven't, hadn't happened thus far. And at her age, it seemed impossible. Now, she and Abram were people of faith, remember. They never drifted into agnosticism or atheism. They weren't on the verge of giving up on the God of the covenant. Not at all. Far from it. But evidently, Sarai could not see how the promises of God were going to be fulfilled unless she and Abram now did something and did something fairly drastic. And so an idea, it, it occurs to Sarai one day. It was not unheard of in the ancient world for servants to bear children in the place of their mistress if she could not conceive. It, it, it happened from, from time to time. And Sarai, she looked over at her Egyptian servant, Hagar. And in Hagar, she began to see an uncomfortable but an efficient solution to a seemingly impossible problem. And so she put the idea to Abram, verse 2. And Sarai said to Abram, Behold, now the Lord has prevented me from bearing children. Go into my servant. It may be that I shall obtain children by her. Often when you hear the story of a major disaster, you learn that there were a series of bad moves made by a series of people that combined to create this perfect storm, this domino effect, the, you know, the nuclear reactor. It overheats because of a, well, a problem in engineering and another problem in manufacture, followed by a problem in monitoring and control, followed by an extra element of, of human error. Or, or, or the, the ship, it sinks because of a de design flaw that is compounded by a loading imbalance that is made more dangerous through a navigation error in the midst of a storm. And all that, it comes together to make for a terrible disaster. It is a domino effect. Well, here in Genesis chapter 16, we begin to see the domino effect of a whole series of sinful blunders. And this first one on the part of Sarai, it is such a warning to us. 
to each one of us. It is a warning to believers who aren't in any way planning or intending to turn our backs on the Lord. And I hope that that's us this morning. We're not planning on doing that. She isn't questioning God's existence. She isn't questioning God's plan. She isn't converting to a pagan religion. She has just grown weary in waiting. Does that sound at all familiar? She's grown impatient. And she has decided that now is the time to take things into her own hands. God doesn't seem to be doing it, so I am going to help him out. I will make this thing happen myself. And her suggestion here, it has to be said, it's not out of step with the culture of the time. These things did take place. We have record of it. But at the same time, this simply isn't God's way. Nowhere has God said that polygamy would ever be his plan. Nowhere has he invited Abram and Sarai to consider this as a real option. And so here is the first domino that falls. It falls within the heart and the mind of Sarai. But the next one, it comes right away. Sarai makes her case. And end of verse 3, Abram listened to the voice of Sarai. Well, two dominoes have fallen so far in the story. And we're going to continue in just a moment. You're listening to Encounter the Truth with Jonathan Griffiths in the book of Genesis chapter 16 today, looking at Abraham and Sarai. And if you ever miss a broadcast or you want to go back and listen again, you can do that when you visit our website. That's EncounterTheTruth.org. There you can stream the program or download an MP3 for free. Again, our website address is EncounterTheTruth.org. And whether you listen online or through the radio, this program is made possible through your generosity. And as you give a gift of any amount this month, we want to send you a book entitled Don't Waste Your Life. In this best-selling book, John Piper challenges Christians to a God-exalting life. And we'd love to send you a copy as our way of saying thank you for your financial support. You can find out more or give online at EncounterTheTruth.org or call us at 1-833-99-TRUTH. That's 1-833-998-7884 or EncounterTheTruth.org. Let's get back to the message. Again, here is Jonathan. And so here is the first domino that falls. It falls within the heart and the mind of Sarai. But the next one, it comes right away. Sarai makes her case. And end of verse 3, Abram listened to the voice of Sarai. Within a marriage, God gives a husband and a wife to one another to provide counsel and encouragement. And in particular, the husband has a God-given role of giving godly leadership within the family. But rather than counterbalance Sarai's suggestion, rather than speak sense and wisdom into the situation, Abram, he, he just hears the heartache in Sarai's voice. He, he, he feels the urgency of her appeal and he unquestioningly goes along with a plan. He actually completely abdicates any responsibility for true leadership here. He ducks the opportunity to steer things in a godly direction, to course correct. And here we actually have a, an echo, don't we, of the Garden of Eden, a powerful echo You remember what happened there? The serpent spoke to Eve, tempted her. She was taken in. And Adam then followed in her sin without raising a single question or an objection. And so another domino falls. The plan, it's initiated. Verse 3. So after Abram had lived 10 years in the land of Canaan, Sarai, Abram's wife, took Hagar the Egyptian, her servant, and gave her to Abram, her husband. As a wife, the mess, it it gets more messy. Abram goes along with this plan that he should have lovingly and firmly refused. He abandons his monogamous commitment to Sarai and embraces the polygamy of the surrounding cultures. And this plan, this arrangement, this sin, well, it only opens the door 
to more sin. The, the next domino, it quickly falls. Hagar duly becomes pregnant. In the middle of verse 4, when she saw that she had conceived, she looked with contempt on her mistress. Now, it's hard to imagine all the emotions of Hagar in this situation, how she might have felt in being asked or coerced or even forced into this arrangement. We just don't have a record. But once she conceives, we do now gain some insight into her feelings and her response. She looks with contempt on her childless mistress, respect of any kind which would have been fitting within the household. Respect for Sarai gives way to smugness and then contempt. Now Hagar is a, a wife of Abram like Sarai is, but she actually has the upper hand because she has produced the much anticipated heir. Unsurprisingly, Sarai, she feels hurt. She feels humiliated and an, another domino falls. She turns her anger now on Abram, verse 5. May the wrong done to me be on you. I gave my servant to your embrace, and when she saw that she had conceived, she looked on me with contempt. May the Lord judge between you and me. It's your fault, Abram. It's all your fault. I let you marry my servant, to help the situation move forward. But look what's happened here. The Lord is going to judge, but I know the verdict. You are guilty, Abram. Your fault. Well, we don't want to be too hard on Sarai here in her distress, but we have to acknowledge as well how unreasonable all this seems. <laughs> this was your idea after all, Sarai. You suggested it. You wanted it this way. And it's not like no one could see that this path forward was strewn with rocks and obstacles and dangers. But in any case, the situation has now led to tension and acrimony between Sarai and Abram. And as if things weren't messy enough already, they quickly get worse. Abram responds to this, not with an attempt to speak reason to the situation, not with a gentle rebuttal to the tirade. No, he just redirects Sarai's anger toward Hagar, who is actually fundamentally helpless, verse 6. Behold, your servant, she's in your power. Do as you please. Look, hey, Hagar may be my wife now, but she still came into this house as a servant. She came into this house as your servant. Do whatever you want with her. But, but, but Abram, <laughs> Hagar, she, she needs protecting here. She, she was dragged into this situation. It hardly upheld her freedom or her dignity in the first place. And now to allow her to become a whipping post for the anger of Sarai. Abram, you can't do that. What are you thinking? Now the next domino falls. Sarai does what we anticipate she would do. She deals harshly with her former servant. She deepens her own sin and her own shame by abusing a defenseless woman within her household. And all this, it leads to the falling of one more domino. All this leads to one more unhappy outcome. Hagar flees. She runs for it. It's a reasonable response, of, of course. We can hardly fault her for running away. But this sad outcome, it is a bad outcome because despite everything, the blessing of God still rests on Abram and his family and his household. Ultimately, for Hagar to know the blessings of God, the salvation blessings of God, she needs to remain part of the family of faith, however messy that family may be. One domino after another, after another, after another. The initial idea, the initial inclination to take matters into human hands, the initial sin, it sets off a cascade of other sins. Sin begets sin here, and things go from bad to worse to worse again. Now, the account of this domino effect, the presentation of this tragic drama before us, it is here for us as a warning it's here as a warning for you and for me in those seasons when the plans of God for the gospel, for the church, for our loved ones, for us personally, when the plans and purposes of God seem slow 
to come to fruition. It's a warning for us, isn't it? For whenever we are tempted to take matters into our own hands and drive them forward in our own way. And I suspect each one of us here, we know something of that temptation. We know something of that experience. And perhaps you personally have seen something of the disastrous results. Maybe you've seen it, I don't know, in a ministry endeavor. Things aren't coming together as you had expected, as you had planned. The Lord hasn't made the provision. He hasn't brought along the partners. He hasn't opened the door, but you are determined anyway. This thing is going to happen. Maybe you've seen it in your evangelism or your discipleship of your loved ones. The, the Lord just, just hasn't yet done the work in their heart that you've been longing he would do. And it's been a long time that you've been praying. And so you decide, okay, now is the time. And, and you push and you cajole. And the results, they're not pretty, are they? Maybe you've seen it in your personal life. The Lord, he hasn't provided that believing spouse that you've been praying for. And so you think, if, you know, if the Lord won't come through for me, here's what I'll do. I will find a sympathetic non-Christian and I'll just, I'll make it work. And of course, the results, they're messy. This is a real area of temptation and danger for us who know the Lord. It's a subtle temptation, of course. It is a subtle danger. Remember, Abram and Sarah, they weren't saying, you know, we don't have faith anymore. They weren't saying that the promises of God were not true. They were not wanting to walk away from the Lord or to stop serving the Lord. No, none of the above, not at all. They believed that the promises of God were true. They believed that his plans would come to fruition ultimately. They simply and wrongly assumed that if God seemed slow in working out his purposes, it was right now for them to take matters into their own hands. It was fine for them to employ a shortcut or two. It was appropriate to drive things through by human means. But the results, as we all can see, the results were disastrous. One sin led to another, which led to another, which led to another, and there was carnage at every turn. Pursuing God's plan, humanity's way, it highlights the domino effect of sin. You know, it is such a temptation to think that we can keep sin under control, but as we've been looking at today, certainly a domino effect. You're listening to Encounter the Truth with Jonathan Griffiths and the first part of a message entitled, The Cost of Self-Reliance. And we're going to continue this message on our next broadcast, so I hope you'll make it a point to listen. If you ever miss a program, come and listen online. Our website is EncounterTheTruth.org. Encounter the Truth is able to be on this station, make the podcast available, and much more because of your generosity. So thank you for giving to and supporting this ministry. And as you give a gift of any amount this month, we want to send you a book called Don't Waste Your Life. It's written by John Piper. And Jonathan, who would you say that this book would be really useful for? Well, I think it's useful for anyone at any stage of life who wants to make sure that they're using their time well and investing their life in the best possible way. So, so that's all of us. And uh, I'd love to get this book into the hands, actually, of every listener to encounter the truth. It's got a special value, I guess, for, for younger people who are thinking, you know, what am I going to do with my life? How shall I invest my energy and my time? And I think this is a great book to read in particular at that stage of life. So if you're a young adult, you're a young person, maybe stuck studying at the present time and you're you're looking out at the open road before you and wondering what to do i'd love you to read this book but maybe you're a parent or a grandparent of such a person and you'd love to prayerfully encourage them to spend their life in the lord's service and to invest their lives in the best possible way get hold of this book and give it to them as a gift i don't think you'll regret doing that one bit well this book is our gift to you as we say thank you for your financial support this month you can give online at EncounterTheTruth.org or call us at 1-833-998-7884. That's 1-833-99-TRUTH. Or again, our website is EncounterTheTruth.org. You can also write us at Encounter the Truth, 2176 Prince of Wales Drive, Ottawa, Ontario, K2E0A1. Or in the U.S. at Encounter the Truth, 
215 North Arlington Heights Road, number 102, Arlington Heights, Illinois, 60004. For Jonathan Griffiths, I'm Steve Hiller. Thanks for listening, and I hope you'll join us next time.